Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm here as always with John, my co-host. How are you doing, John? Good. Happy New Year's, actually, yeah. because we haven't done a pod at the New Year. We had our bonus, but uh, Happy New Year's, Dan. Nice to see yeah. you. And uh, uh, again, I just want to thank people that have been, uh, we've had so many uptake on our followers on LinkedIn this week and some great comments. So I want to thank people for your continued support and people uh, listening to the pod. Yeah. And it's, we have a nice little panel here. It's definitely great. We're recording this on, on Sunday lunchtime on the 14th of Jan. I just got back from skiing. I was just chatting to Wolfgang before you guys came on. I was up with my son up really early in the morning, got got three hours in on the mountain, now back home just in time for the pod. So busy, busy day for me today. Perfect. Yeah, I went uh, cross country skiing yesterday and it was amazing. Blue skies. Where I live, it's it's there's a the Lake La, La Clément, Lake Geneva, as many people know it, is kind of in a bowl and surrounded by the Alps and the Jura. And then once you go past 700 meters, it's just like a sea of clouds and blue skies. So that was uh, that was really good. And it snowed all week. So we were, yeah, the place was packed, jam packed. Yeah, it's been freezing in Prague, but uh, like minus minus 15 it was for a day or two. It's been really, really bad, but it's getting a bit warmer now. Yeah. Dan, it's kind of interesting that we have TRC here today because, you know, we, we've interviewed a lot of different organizations and uh, the wonderful guests that are on our screen and we're going to hear your voices have done so much work in the ed tech world and have been uh, IT directors and coordinators and digital coaches in so many different schools around the world. So I, this is going to be kind of like the powerhouse, you know, it's like the Hollywood celebrities on the panel. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, for sure, John. So um, today we've got um, Wolfgang, Brian and Garland um, joining us from, from different parts of the world who, um, and we'll get into what the TRC is and, and what the history is. But first of all, I think it'd be great um, if you guys can uh, can introduce yourself. Wolfgang, if you want to go, then Brian, then, then Garland. Sure. Um, thanks. Uh, and happy new year to you as well. Great being back on the show. It seems like, uh, you know, every couple of months, it's my second home now speaking to you guys. It's really great and uh, and always a pleasure. Um, I'm I'm at the same place than John, not quite living in the same place, but under the clouds in Geneva. Um, currently as ICT campus partner, working for one of the campuses uh, at the International School of Geneva, but have known Garland and Brian for a long, long time. And it's a great pleasure to be on a panel with them talking about the Technology Readiness Council. Thank you. Brian? Okay, I'm Brian Lockwood. I'm currently the IT director at the International School of Manila. So unlike everyone else where you're dealing with snow, I'm dealing with tropical weather. So uh, <laughs> sweat and being warm. And uh, this this winter or in Manila, they don't call it winter. They just call it the dry season. So it's just drier, but it's the same temperature. Um, but I've been in uh, the international education since uh, 2005. And... I've been in several countries all around the world, just uh, growing my experience as in an IT director role. And all I can say is you think you know everything until you start and you'll find out, my gosh, all those years of experience doesn't make a difference because there's always a new problem and you have to figure it out like it was brand new. So true. Well said. Definitely. Garland. Well, good morning, I guess, or afternoon, depending on the part of the world you're in. Um, Name's Garland Green, and I've kind of, I guess, uh, John, maybe you and I are some, we're the salty dogs, I suppose, here. I got started in this tech business back in 1995, and uh, back when we were defending uh, the internet is not a fad with our teachers, <laughs> uh, and um, and really, and really got started. I'm currently right now in um, Northampton, Massachusetts. I work as a tech director at a, at a regional school district here in Massachusetts, after having been overseas since 2000, so I moved back. I've got some some young boys. I'm an older father, a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and uh, moved them back to the States here so they get an opportunity to experience uh, life here. But as Brian is talking about, you know, I think there's something to be said about the speed of the change that's happening right now with technology. But in many cases, uh, Wolfgang and I were talking this morning, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The difference is the issue of the nuances and our ability to manage 
And uh, I think right now, uh, I've shared this before, I think now is the single most important time to be a tech director. I think it's most exciting time. But the half-life on solutions and thoughts uh, it keeps shrinking uh, with the speed of these things. And uh, I'm excited to get an opportunity to, to talk and share with you guys what we've been doing here at the TRC. Thank you. Great. Well, I think um, I think it'd be great to talk about the origin story of of, of the TRC. And I, I think, Brian, the... Um, there's a, a great community called the Tech Director uh, Community, which uh, you should definitely definitely join if, you, if you're a tech director or you work in tech at schools. And um, that that I believe was well, that was definitely the the the, the precursor. Obviously, the TRC is pretty recent. I mean, Brian, do you want to say a few words and anyone else jump in about how the how the forum started and, and how it developed? Yeah, I'll try to. I mean, I'll go back. Even it started in 2007, but I'll give a background story even before that. Um, before working in international schools, I worked at a private school in Boston um, as a tech director. And there was always a vibrant uh, mail list called the Wizards. And I found it super uh, useful, but it had the context of private schools within the United States. And when I was overseas, I always wished that there was something like that for international schools. And I had I had a few um, attempts and failures in it. I tried to create a group in uh, Japan called like the Apple user, user Groups, or I even forgot the name. I bought the domain. I did. I got the mail list all set up. And there was just no uh, traction on it. On, on Tech Director, I'm not the person that started it. It was actually started by Paul White. He was um, the IT director at NIST, I think from uh, 2002 to 2008, I'm not sure, some, something around that time. But uh, what happened is there was the first Learning 2.0 conference that happened in uh, Shanghai at uh, Concordia International School. And that was such a vibrant uh, event where we had an opportunity to really connect with so many people, but we got introduced to so many different tools that allowed connection. So you had Twitter, you had Facebook, you had Edmodo, you had all these tools and you had links. And Paul White was the one that actually created uh, the Ning. Uh, and he just, he just, we had an email chain going along and he said, I've just created this Ning. Instead of doing an email chain, let's just work on the Ning and it'll be easier to follow. And so he created it. Um, I got on board and I started organizing the the menus and and whatnot. And he saw that I was quite active on it, uh, so he gave me uh, administrative access. He actually gave Warren Apple administrator access first, then he gave me administrator access, and from then on, it was basically me. Most of the time, Warren was was taking. Uh, taking bits and bobs of taking care of it. But I think primarily I was involved with trying to keep engagement on the site. And the main thing to keep engagement was to look for job openings and post them on, on the forum. And so when it was in the Ning format, there was, there was a lot of conversation. Um, and, uh, but, but to get people to come, it was to put those, those job postings. It was only in 2008 that we saw that the Ning platform was just not something that we could continue with. And we made the switch to uh, discourse. And when we made the switch to discourse, that was a huge change in how the um, uh, communication or discussions is, is started shifting from people just looking for jobs, but having really good discussions about how they can solve things. So the, the, the dream I had from what I saw at Wizards it was realized by 2018 you know, or 2019, around that time. And then, of course, the pandemic happened, and that even made it more popular. Um, and then we made uh, monthly video uh, meetups, and that, again, accelerated growth and just went on and on like that. So it's very vibrant right now. I just want to jump in because having been part of that for quite a few years, I can't echo enough the amazing work that uh, you've done, Brian, and the people behind that, because I know so many people 
uh, often are, like you say, in this existential situation where they come to a new job and they thought they had it and they don't. And uh, there's some problems. And I just think that place is such a great place to go and get those things. And what I appreciate is people are really willing to give a lot of detail and then also go offline and email you and say, hey, let's jump on a call. Let me walk you through that. So I just want to applaud you know, yourself and all the other people that have been involved because I think it's so important, especially when you are a new tech director or a new digital learning coach and you come to a school where there may be not other people uh, in the community or even in your region, and this suddenly becomes a great lifeline. So uh, just something I wanted to amplify. It's yeah. funny, just having a quick flashback to Ning. I, I used to, <clears throat> about 11, 12 years ago, I used to run a Ning called the International School Teacher. I'm not sure if any of you ever remember it. It was a guy called Troy White who started it. I didn't oh, know, yeah. but just somehow got introduced to him. And he said, I, I can't be bothered with this. And I said, I'll, I'll take it over. And uh, I did it for about a year or two. And then it wasn't going anywhere. You know, I wasn't putting enough effort into it. And, and, and the, you know, I had to, I had to, Ning was quite expensive back then, actually. I seem to remember. They got rid yeah. of a free plan. So uh, I mean, it never, it never, I think I passed it to somebody else, actually. But I, I, I think it died off in the end. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that helped out. So, uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, when you're trying to make a synopsis of what happened, I mean, Wolfgang was very involved. Uh, uh, I know um, Jason at uh, at NIST, currently at NIST, he was very involved with it. So there's different players that have been involved. And when it caught, when, the, when Ning did cost a lot of money, then uh, 21st Century Learning with Justin, he, he stepped in, he paid for that. So it's been, I think what's neat about the, the community, it's really is a community. We're all working together to keep that site alive. So it's, I don't, I, I like to stay away to say that I'm the, uh, you know, I don't want to have everything coming towards me because I'd rather have it to be a community. And, and, and that's in some ways why I like the partnership with the TRC. It's bringing it back to the community. That's interesting because I think, you know, so often there are a lot of groups that get together and try to build something and have a community and the, the capacity to make it sustainable and last that many years is really challenging. So I'm just curious amongst Garland and Wolfgang and Brian, you know, if if you're a school or you're a group of teachers and you want to start something like that, what is the, the, the secret to making these things sustainable over years? We're talking over, am I correct, 2007. So you're almost uh, going to 20 years here in three years. So that's a long time for an organic, flat leadership uh, community to survive. I'm just curious if any of you had some thoughts on that, about what is the sauce, the secret sauce for sustainability of such groups? I think it comes down to value, John. You know, if something has value and people can 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 contribute to to that, uh, that's the sustainability piece. And everybody wants to be in a position where they can contribute. And at the same time, if you have everybody chattering about some of the same stuff, uh, you know, I mean, how many times have we had conversations about, well, are you using power school? No, we're on ISAMs. Uh, you know, that conversation is bounced around. And so after a while, it runs out of runway on those kinds of conversations. But the sustainability is relevant and value to the group and the organization. I, that's that's my take on that. I'm curious to hear what the other fellows think. Yeah, I think, I mean, just to, to, to jump in on, on the back of that, I think one aspect from the tech director forum and 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 now we'll talk a little bit later about the trc is is uh, what we are very aware of in in education the intrinsic or motivation factor and i think um the existence of it is really down to the fact that people have an intrinsic motivation to contribute but also to be part of something where it's not uh forced upon anybody to necessarily contribute or or not, but it's it's people seem to check in on it very regularly. That it seems to be on their um, agenda or on their to do list for a weekly task to go onto the tech director forum, have a look what people are saying. And sometimes it takes a bit longer, but you can be guaranteed that if you ask a question, for the most part, you're going to get some engaging feedback and answers back. Uh, and then, as Brian said, I think with the development through COVID of of introducing the Tech Talk Tuesday, which was a monthly event. That's also massively elevated the fact that we can take the top hot topics, maybe two, three, four, five, depending on the on the month, and actually have a roundtable discussion. Um, again, for anybody who wants to join, that's part of the forum. 
And I think, you know, Garland and Wolfgang, the point of added value and the value. But what I think I'm hearing, too, is that you went beyond the ISAMS power school conversation. So there was a fluidity and an awareness that different topics were hotter or more important, more prominent. And always being able to navigate that flexibility, I think, is what's really great. And the way the, if you have not been, there's a wonderful structure. So you can do jobs, you can do operating systems. There are just a lot of different conversations. There's kind of a multifaceted conversation. I think for me, and I know other people that I talk to, that's what's so uh, powerful is that uh, capacity to be very fluid and adaptable to the changes and make sure that whatever is current, there is some point of reference to support you. Yeah, I think just jumping in on that really briefly, I think um, when when the switch was made from the Ning to the uh, to the discourse uh, environment, I think one of the hopes that that Brian certainly and Jason and I and, and Warren had discussed when when making the switch switch was that at, towards the end, the Ning, as Brian had said, became probably the most powerful and successful job board for tech related um, jobs in the educational sector. But the actual conversation and contribution towards um, questions that that were genuinely a little bit more complicated, that needed a bit more time and thought to answer, died down a little bit towards the end. And I think that's the the, the revival of of that has happened through that switch to a maybe slightly more attractive or modern platform. Um, but I see that really having gained traction now. And I think often platform and look has a really big importance. I know Dan and I always talk about that, the idea of branding and what's the value of your platform and how you do it. I think, you know, the other thing, being an IT director in international schools sometimes can be very lonely in the sense that you are in a physical location. You might be the only school or the other schools don't have the same dynamics, they're not international, or they might not have an expatriate community. And sometimes the systems and the approaches have to be different than maybe what is done locally. And having that big forum really allows you to reach out and say, hey, I, you have the same problem as I, or you're feeling my pain. Uh, you know, those kind of things I think are so important. So uh, thank you, Garland and Wolfgang, the kind of uh, address that value, uh, idea of value. Dan? No, it, it sounds, sounds great. I, I, I completely agree. It's, um, and I, you know, I've have, like, have I said, I've had a couple of forums of finally, we, I've got a successful one now with, with the Google with very, very focused, very niche on, on Google admin, you know? And so I, 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 very, I do, I do respect the challenges and, and, and being able to keep one going for this long is, you know, like Brian said, I think the, the main thing is you need a team. You need a few people, other people involved to, to make it a success. So one of the things, uh, you know, if people are watching our YouTube stream or listening, the word TRC keeps popping up. So what would be interesting is maybe uh, is, is the director it directors tech talk uh, a morphing into trc or what are those two entities and why who would like to jump in i'll be happy to talk a little bit uh, about how the technology readiness council came to be uh, i think is we've all talked about there's been over the years an attempt to connect us because in our schools you know, internationally speaking, we're probably the only one that does what we do. And if we do have more people with us, we're a very small team and we, we function as a, you know, mission critical part of the work that we do, but we're kind of the, the crowd of people that we would prefer that you just stay in your corner and don't talk to me until I need you. And, and that's that traditional sense of keep the lights on and that's what you're working. Well, then, then we have the second piece of it, which is the educational technology piece of it, where, where your tech department goes and your innovation is where you go. So we've had starts with the tech forum and we want to do the chatting, but Brian, I'm going to need you to step in because you're better at this. When, when did we meet in Frankfurt? Uh, when was that conversation in Frankfurt? Oh, I, mean, I mean, I think it's 2016. Yeah. 2016. I'm yeah, because there was that 
that meetup, the State Department meetup? Yes. Okay. So the State Department also for the United States has also had a set of State Department schools that they sponsor, and then they put together a, a group of people to try to create um, a response should something happen, should schools close. And this is pre-pandemic. But it was a lot of that. Uh, Garland, was I'm just going to interrupt you. It's the United States uh, State Department. So yes. it's the uh, Department of Overseas Schools. Well, just for our listeners that might not be aware, that is part of the U.S. State Department. So it's an education arm. Sorry to interrupt you. Just no, no, thank you. Thank you, actually. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and do that again. It, it bring me on track here. So so we were having a meeting, and I had gone I had gone to Kathmandu when I was in Israel, and I met up with with uh, with Michael McGlave and I met up with uh, I don't know if you were there or not Brian but I had you know we'd been been engaged in that conversation in an attempt to try to bring tech directors together to prepare our schools for for the future and prime but it was focused primarily on earthquakes and you know riots and stuff like that and um, so as we were sitting around talking it occurred to me that what we really needed at that case or at least a, the the raw thought of it started the genesis of it was. Um, I was a big fan of a fellow by the name of David Weinberger. David Weinberger is a is a author of a thousand different books, and he's still pretty active. But particularly, I started reading his work when he co-authored a book called The Clue Train Manifesto in 1999. Great book, right, Dan? If you know the book, you'll know that it was it was uh, it was a start. It was one of those people like, wow, these people really get it. But David Weinberger said something that I uh, that stuck in my mind, and it's been an, it, it's been something that's been driving a lot of my own personal. Life, he said, the knowledge isn't in your head. It's not in yours, John or Wolfgang, Dan, uh, Brian. The knowledge is in the conversation. And so that struck me as saying that what we really needed is we needed to be in a situation where we could have quality conversations to help create a um, a broader sense that moved beyond the bits, the bites, the box, the stuff that the everyday. Um, I don't want to call it minutia or 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 that stuff, but it's important. But it's but it can't be the driver if you're going to have a, you know, a, I call them the dark side of the moon conversations. You have to think big and push it out. So we started kicking around this idea. So I wrote a white paper and I passed it around to uh, Christy from the Department of Oracy Schools and a few other people saying that what if we could get together a group of individuals that um, did more than just that, that we focused on things like coaching. We, we focused on things like um uh, these broader conversations and educational technology. And the idea being is, is that you'd bring in a group of leaders who are masters in their, their craft and start thinking about sustainability across the board. And uh, so then that started the technology readiness council. We started with a group of people, put together a board um, and made it a nonprofit organization in Brussels, in Belgium. And then we started reaching out and finding individuals who were real thought leaders, people who were were um, willing to to take. I, I have this discussion. I say it all the time. You know, I'm, I'm Garland Green. I like to have the dark side of the moon conversations. But then I have to also be ready for what about that rural school in Uwagadugu? You know what I mean? Yeah, you can have those wonderful, lovely conversations, Garland. But I have to hit it on the ground. So the Technology Readiness Council is is a way to bridge, have those broader conversations. You know what the Cheshire Cat said, you know, in, in Alice in Wonderland, you know, if you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. And, and that's kind of this conversation about, you know, let's have those 50 foot conversations. Let's have those, you know, big conversations, but put a group of thought leaders in place to see how we can put those in, into the ground. And by bringing in a, a high quality group of individuals that sit on the leadership of the council, we can we can have those conversations, but at the same time, I think what's important here is that you need to vet conversation. You need to have a group of individuals say, "Yeah, yeah, no, no, I get it. I know that you have a ten thousand dollar budget and you're going to build the single most technologically advanced school district in North Africa with recycle boxes and Linux." Okay, I get it, but maybe we should think about how we can sustain over time. And the whole idea came in was that we wanted to build new young leaders. You know, um, some of us still have our hair um, some, and those of us that do are, uh, are graying and we need to think about the next level of, of leaders that are going to come in. So where is that value you brought in? And so that became the Technology Readiness Council, brought Brian on board, uh, brought Wolfgang on board and a group of other people. And we started to backfill our council with 
real thought leaders, but also thought doers and, and bringing Excellent. it out. Brian, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to um, dovetail on how the tech director in some ways uh, meets up with this. One of the, one of the fr sort of frustrations I've had with, with not being able to help people is when they've asked for PD, what professional development do they need to become a tech director? And I've given them what I, I did, and I did a, a master's in education technology at Lesley University. But a lot of, it, it sort of does, you know, it gets you that master's degree in education, but does it match what you actually do as a tech director? It doesn't. Um, and, and I've always struggled with how do I, how do I help these young uh, members become better and get the, the education they need? And the best thing I could do sometimes is do mentorship. So I would do very informal mentorship, mostly through LinkedIn. Like they would, you know, send me a message and then I'll try to give them advice and, and whatnot. But even that was hard because I couldn't always give 100% time. Sometimes I'd be busy and sometimes I'm not. And when I'm not busy, I can give that time. And then other times I just can't even answer. So the the this is where the TRC fits in really well. It's all those 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 wants and wishes that all our young members really want to get better at at this uh, profession, but don't know where to go. And I think it's interesting the way you use the uh, the anecdote of having done a master's in education uh, technology leadership. I think it's so true that whatever that is, it's more theoretical, it's more big picture. But the day to day issues and the learning curve that as a tech director has to engage with in a very short span of time, you can't wait till the summer to enroll in a course. It's like, what could, who could help me right now? And, you know, kind of that real time support. And so many, so much of it is contextual and depending where you are. And I think, you know, what I, I'm, I'm hearing is that because this council has these rich thought leaders and, and is broad in scope in the sense of different regions, that suddenly becomes a very rich pool to tap into. And as you're saying, Brian, that gives an avenue for young aspiring tech directors and leaders to say, wow, I can just jump into this ecosystem and there are various streams and conversations happening and there are people I can lean on. So I think that's just fantastic. Wolfgang, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I also think that um, additionally to the to the thought leadership and the and the and the thought doers, as as, as Garland quite rightly said, um, in the in in my year in industry, I always call my, call it my sabbatical. But I, I came in contact and worked quite a lot with um, a EU Commission subsidy called the European School Net. And what I really appreciated about their um, being is basically that they act as a voice of reason and recommendation within this noise that is educational technology and they work with incubators around Europe they work with all of the different educational governance and and, and governments um, and try to really look at what technology exists filter it down into what technology actually makes sense without being biased to um, getting bought out or being sponsored or whatever it may be so they really maintain that non-profit voice of, of, of reason and thought. And, and I think we're trying to do the same thing, but more on a global scale so that when the TRC works with partners or looks at a potentially recommendation of services, we spend a lot of time within our circle of, of, of experienced, massively experienced um, tech directors and educational technologists, but also school leaders to say, how can we provide that sort of um, pointing towards certain services or partners without schools having to do that because it's all well and good you know the five of us we're very lucky we've, we've we've been very good at networking we've been we've been to lots of conferences we've met lots of people but the majority of people don't either have that financial um, ability to to go around the world or go to these very meaningful and, and networking rich uh, events or they just don't know and, and it's exactly that sort of silo, you know, we, we all think that it's very easy to access because of the, the, the internet and, and forums and, and platforms, that it's very easy to, to access information and get help. But actually, a lot of it is very motivated by profit or by profitability. And so I do foresee us be, becoming a, that voice in that space that people will come to and, and seek advice from. 
Thank you. So if I'm, I, for example, I'm a tech director. I just uh, I'm at a school in some area of the world and I'm the only international school within 200 kilometers and I'm doing something. I'm implementing a system or I'm dealing with the dynamics within the team. I can then reach out to your ecosystem and say, hey, I've got this issue. And then you provide them with uh, various pathways to engage with, or is it on a membership? You have to be a member. And then as a member, you tap into this. Yeah, so maybe quickly to explain, and I think um, Garden and Brian can probably talk a little bit more about the services or, or the, the, the future of services. So at the moment, what we're trying to do is we're trying to commit schools to a minimum of, or members to a minimum of two years with a 500 euro per year contribution. And the reason really for that contribution and the membership fee is as a nonprofit, we want to also arrange and host events with quality experts and professionals that may or may not cost money, but we want to have a pool of funds to allow us to, to be that professional voice of reason. And I think we all appreciate that that doesn't come for free necessarily. The services we the, the, that we need to buy into for provisioning um, to run our services, but also the, the the events that we want to host, the ambitions that we have with our strategic and future plan will require membership service, but it also means that there's a commitment from our members. And we've talked a lot about actually a, a massive differentiator, I think, between us and, and maybe some of these other uh, platforms or organizations that exist is that our fundamental expectations for any member to join is also for them to contribute as much as they take and only then will our community and our council actually work because there's there are too many platforms where you pay and you get but actually for us the membership is nearly an uh, an uh, an opening of a door into a community that is a very hard working and contributing community so all the members that have currently joined and we're, we're uh, we've got quite a few already have all basically signed up to giving time as much as getting resources that's a nice model uh the giving you know for every anything that you take you have to give something back dan <clears throat> i think that resonates with you yeah definitely i think it's it's the only way to build a community isn't it like if, if people if, if you get people who are going to participate and, and be and be you know committed to it then yeah definitely it's it's, it's the right philosophy garland you know it, it comes back to as wolfgang the same it's always been our thought that you know going back to the conversation we had where the knowledge is in the conversation um, and contextualizing it uh, is, is a really important piece. I, what, what we're starting to see now, and this is something where we have for services. So we already have developed a very robust, rich uh, data privacy course uh, in which uh, the TOC offers. So if somebody wants to learn about data privacy, particularly in the GDPR, but also around the world, because more and more data privacy is coming in, particularly through the use of AI and what's happening with that and how is that going to impact the future. So we, we've developed these courses and the idea being is, is that if you want to focus in on a particular area of your craft, then we're building, building out these courses, which are largely conversations, not just, uh, you know, testing or whatever, but primarily to give you exposure and contextualize it into your, into your work as well. But we're also seeing that what a lot of young technologists struggle with is, is less about the actual physical technical portions of running the job, switches, routers, that sort of stuff. But the real struggle is uh, the, uh, the institutional political struggles that you're dealing with with the issue surrounding change, right? What we've discovered, I think all of us can have, <laughs> depending upon what you're drinking, multiple conversations about uh, what it's like to be a technology director because you find yourself being 90% therapist, 10% technologists. How do I negotiate this feeling? Because again, we're the only ones that do what we do in our school. We're mission critical. There's a, you know, how do you demystify what we do? And the Technology Readiness Council isn't just about the bits and bytes box. It's about the politics surrounding it as well and how you manage yeah, and I think that's a really good point is so often uh, people, as you said, have the technical background, have the expertise, uh, but I think the people 
the politics, the relationships, all of those. And so often tech directors are caught in between because they are mission critical. And there, you have to not only educate your faculty, but you're also educating the leadership team, you know, and you're kind of caught between both. And navigating that can be quite demanding. And I know uh, the whole idea of change process is so, so complex and also contextual. Brian. Yeah, I was just going to say um, the the I can just explain my, the own value I've had with the TRC, and um, we had sort of our informal uh, TJFs events uh, every Friday during COVID, and it allowed us to it was like a therapy session in some ways, right? It it, it allowed to share and gain um, insight from fellow members. Uh, of the situation we were in and how to handle it. And I would say that I'm so thankful that I was actually in Europe during the, the COVID uh, scenario because um, having that group to meet up every Friday just made it so much easier. And I think if we, if we, you know, my ideal world was like, how do you replicate that and allow other people to uh, uh, benefit from such a, a, a beautiful and wonderful network because it's, it's the politics, but it's also a place where you need to talk with people. Um, and, and, and again, it, it is, it's like therapy. You need to have someone to talk to in trust um, and explain maybe this type of scenario you went through and how it's just blowing your mind out of the, you don't know what to do. <laughs> and then you hear some, some, oh, I had the exact same thing. This is how I dealt with it. Or don't worry, Brian, you're going to get through it. You're good. You're, you're, you're on track. Don't worry about it. Uh, we had a guest call, uh, Ken, that talked about creating safe and brave spaces. Brave, safe spaces are kind of maybe more uh, docile, but a brave space is where you're having those conversations and really uh, supporting the person and everybody is kind of being brave to try something different, but with the support. So, Brian, that's great to hear that anecdote. Wolfgang. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, I had this conversation last week with somebody about um, some of the things that I think the TRC is going to evolve into in future. And one thing that came to mind is uh, quite a few years ago, I think probably in 2012 or 13, around then, I did a PTC course and Bambi Betts was actually leading it. And one of the um, aspects of it that stood out for me as I remember, and, and it's only because I'm still in touch with, with most of the people, were these sort of confidential meetup groups that she formed at the end of the day. And the for vignettes. an hour, yeah, the vignettes and at the end of every day for an hour we would meet in a small group with 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 the understanding that basically what happens at the pct P, P, ptc stays at, with the ptc and it formed friendships for life i think because we were genuinely open to sharing confidential and personal conflicts or issues or problems that we were having in an environment where people were ready to share potential um, advice and I think that's something, as Brian said, the sort of trust element that we had during COVID um, when it was the more informal TGIF meetups that we had as we were norming and storming and forming the TRC and what it might become and what it is becoming now. I think the, the reason this is working so well and where you know we don't have the power hungry person sitting on the board or leadership is because there's mutual trust um, through that situation of saying, we all have things that we're strong at and good at and that we can contribute at. And we all have things that we need to improve or are not so good at, but we're not shy or, or, or afraid to share that. And I think that's what a community like the TRC can, can certainly um, offer in future is becoming a community of, of trust and, and, uh, and a, a space to share. And I think, you know, if you come with a problem and you talk to somebody that's not in your context and doesn't have the history or the the kind of the nitty gritty of the politics and you share your story, you're getting kind of a very level headed, even handed return. And that can be really helpful. They don't understand the dynamics or anything, but they're just hearing your side of the story and they're making those connections, as you said, Brian, 
to what they've done and either they they're encouraging you and, and giving you positive reinforcement or they're handing over some wisdom and some strategies that you can walk away with. And I think that is just I think that's why these kind of groups do so well. And there are many of them around the world, especially with international schools. You see that. Yeah, and I think, uh, John, sorry to jump in again, I think that's a good point, maybe, um, as, a, as I'm also aware of time, so maybe for, for the three of us to, to, to give a little bit of an overview of where we see the future of the Technology Readiness Council. So from, from my perspective, what I've been concentrating really is on, on getting our name out there and networking, because I think that's so important. If nobody knows about what we are and what we're trying to do, then uh, it will die a very quick death. But the, the resonance that we found with anybody that we've approached so far is that uh, it's it's a unique community that doesn't really exist in the same format. And that actually has uh, astonished me because there are so many communities out there, but yet we are in this niche that's missing where without the, the, the profit driven aspect of it and uh, without sort of a an agenda other than trying to make good and be good in the educational world from a moral and ethical approach, I think that's going to be our success. So the future really holds us being able to look at uh, partnerships with, with current organizations or individuals that provide quality services from a similar ethical and moral stance and looking to expand that, um, that world really so that our members benefit. Other than our, we also have monthly discussion panels. We're going to have at the end of this month, our first members uh, round table where we're going to be inviting two experts in. So watch the space for that. But other than that, I think it's it's a really exciting time. Garland. We're, uh, while, while Wolfgang and his team are working on uh, spreading the word as to who we are, we have another group of team that is really down in the dirty, right? We're building, building out things like uh, our coaching program is coming along. We're doing a lot of work and putting together a, a way for uh, us to share out cybersecurity. <clears throat> We're building courses on, you know, a place where people can jump in and, and talk about those things, the nitty gritty part of stuff, because conversations are extremely important. And um, also, uh, you know, data protection authority and, you know, uh, you have to do all that stuff. But there's cybersecurity, there's coaching and uh, we're, we're building that stuff. So when people when people say, all right, I like it, I like where you're going, where are some resources and how can I get engaged in the everyday down and dirty part of that part of our life we're building out those resources we're pretty excited about some of the stuff that we have uh, we're feeling that with the expertise that we have around the world contributing it's it's uh, it's it's a quality quality piece of work and i assume that these uh resources are asynchronous and synchronous or how does it work both both right so because of, because we're dealing globally so we have we have a strong asynchronous component piece to it and then we also have the part where you're with a person similar to this, where you can meet up with people and have those <clears> conversations. <throat> Again, getting back to this, I keep driving this home, the, the knowledge is in the conversation, the ability to think it through. You know, we would, like we would talk about, we'd all sit down, we'd grab, uh, grab a drink, and we'd meet on Fridays, and we would think through complex conversations. And that's where the value came in. That's, that's the thing. We can vet you know, if it's a wild idea, it's a wild idea, but it's it's both synchronous and asynchronous. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so I assume that uh, it's strictly a focus on international schools or am I wrong in saying that? It's it's not just an international school thing. It's it's a technology thing within the context of schools. Um, I'm like I said, I, I'm working in a public school right now and the issues are the same. All right, different context legally and how you have to respond, but even an international school may have to deal with local governments in the same way. Yeah, and I, I would I would maybe I would maybe add so so in a conversation, for example, that I've had with the European school that is where local governments certainly looking at Europe because that's that's a region I know more about. Local schools often don't have access to a dedicated tech director or an ed tech facilitator. And so if we're going to be true to our mission, then we need to be helping organizations who are doing a really good job within that sphere by maybe providing our expertise and passing them along as well. So there's opportunities to work with more regional and governmental organizations and schools through us acknowledging the network and access we have to people who are experts in these fields and then maybe providing them through their conferences or events or other types of 
uh, organized um, happenings that we can contribute that way. Yeah, it's interesting, John. I was actually going to ask the same question. I mean, I'm guessing, I'm guessing you guys are thinking of any kind of a base membership of, of international schools in the beginning, because these are people who are obviously, like, like, like you mentioned, have tech teams, tech facilitators, tech coaches, in, in a lot of cases, things like that. Are, are you seeing that that as kind of your base and to spread out from there? I think maybe just to, uh, to quickly answer, so, I mean, that's our natural world that, that most of us have been in for a long, long time. But as Garland said, he's he's back in the state, more in a in a local regional con uh, context. And I think that will always change. Tech directors, some stay internationally forever, some go back in the, uh, to their own regions or other regional uh, environments. I think right now the base is more the international school scene because that's our natural network to tap into. Yeah. So one of the wow. things uh, that you know. I'm, I'm hearing is that it's really the idea of giving with a certain amount of generosity and really you, the, the word profit keeps coming back when you guys talk this idea that there's these people that are doing things for profit. And then there's the TRC, which really is about giving and there is no, there's monetization just to keep you afloat for some of the workflows. And, and, you know, you definitely need some money to, to run, you know, the ecosystems that you're doing. But the idea of it being an open community is really, I think, quite interesting. And there are many open communities, and that's definitely a philosophy and an approach. And I think so often as schools and educators, we navigate this kind of landscape of different communities. Some are for pay and for profit and others are not. And I think it's just really uh, so rich when a lot of teachers don't often have the professional development funds to travel or a lot of these things that are restrictions or timetables or just their own work to have this rich resource to tap into. So if I am not a member school and I'm just float, I'm busy at some school as a tech director or digital learning coach or even an educator can I tap into you or do I need a gate? I need a, a pass card to get in. So all of our events that we host are open to the public. But for example, to participate um, in things like the members round table discussions, to participate in our work groups um, and build those resources and have access to those resources for a multitude of reasons, um, you need to be a member. But our events that we host, they're always live streamed and recorded and then posted publicly. And then the uh, tech director's talk, Brian, continues as it is. Th that hasn't changed. Yeah, that's still the same. I'm trying. I'm I'm, I'm not as uh, vigorous as before. I was during COVID. I was doing it every single month because I, I wasn't traveling and I didn't, you know, so it was, it was very easy to do. So now it's a bit more sporadic. It only happens really during the, the months of work. Um, but I was going to add in to the, you kept on asking a question. If people are asking a que like a specific question where they can get that information, I would say the tech director forum is the perfect place to go because you can just join. It doesn't cost anything. And, uh, you just join in and you post your question and get your answer. And TRC is supporting that, that, that forum. So there is a partnership between the TRC and tech director on that side. Nice. Very nice. So I'm just mindful of time and, you know, first of all, thank you uh, for sharing this and uh, just go to the show notes as so many of you are so familiar and I know we always get positive feedback regarding the show notes. It's a great way to connect with our guests, also see some of the things that they're reading and also connect with them through social media. So at the show notes, you can get more details about the Technology Readiness Council and some of the other uh, activities that they're doing. And then, of course, there's the Tech Directors Forum, which is open and continues as it is, from what I understand. As we wrap up, I'm just wondering if each one of you have what's on your mind here for 2024 in the context of your role, just kind of, and the TRC. Just a very little quick, uh, I'm looking at this. This is what I'm thinking. Garland. 
really getting down to the brass tacks of building courses and and being able to backfill a lot of the areas that we're moving at that's that's where that's where i believe that uh, i'm the strongest and i think our team of people are starting to get to to the down and dirty really expanding our offering those asynchronous and then once people come in it's it's a, it's about talking conversations it's about walking you through what we've got there and and growing growing you as a professional brian that's I look at it as really, um, I really like the, 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 the live shows we've been doing for the last two weeks or last month, because I've been able to tie that back into the tech director into specific conversations. So I'm making stronger links between the, the, the two sites. And I'm also really eager to get the mentorship program going. I have so many people just dying to have that uh, expert insight in how they can go beyond where they are, uh, wherever they are. And I'd love to be able to get that started so that I can say, here, you can go here. You can join TRC. This is the value you'll get out of it that going through that mentorship program. Great, Wolfgang. So for me, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm concentrating and, and want to continue concentrating on the on the networking aspect of, of getting us out there and really getting to the schools who, who, who have less ability and means to find out about us. So that we don't miss those who probably need us the most and i think my my work this year will really be focused on making sure that we provide a service that isn't exclusive but actually inclusive of, of all and um most schools that need us and uh looking at ways of how also maybe we can financially support schools in the futures joining us that may not have the same budgets as, as others but really the, the philanthropical aspect of the work that we want to be doing Great. So I just want to remind our audience, it's the Technology Readiness Council, and you can go to their website and tap into a lot of things. Dan, any thoughts or reflections? No, I'm really keen um, to see how this is going. I've had a few chats with Wolfgang, definitely keen to get involved and uh, look forward to, to catching up with Wolfgang this week and, and, and seeing how this develops. I think it's a great initiative. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's so nice is this idea of uh, being generous and being kind and sharing at no cost because i think that's where we only get better as you said garland it's in the conversation where the learning happens and if you can have these conversations without worrying about your uh, pocket uh and how much it's cost that can be really engaging for people especially people in international schools that might not be uh in situations where there's uh, large sums to support professional development and uh, we have such a rich uh kind of proliferate of different types of international schools in different physical and geographic locations. And I think, uh, you know, the idea of generosity and, and giving to others is part of many missions of schools. So lovely to see an organization uh, building its mission and work based on that. So thank you very much, uh, Garland, Brian, and Wolfgang. And uh, thank you to our audience. Check out the show notes to find out more about Technology Readiness Council. And we look forward to connecting with you. Dan, we'll uh, see you very soon. Cheers, guys. Take care. I've got to jump right off. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Dan.